Why Tulip Calvinism is Unbiblical. This is part two of this six-part series. And uh, in this message, I'm going to be dealing with the T of Tulip, which is total depravity. We're going to look at this doctrine in detail. And then I'm going to talk about how man is a fallen creature. The Bible does teach that, that we are all fallen and we are sinful by nature. Then we're going to look at God, how He has given man sufficient light. And then we're going to talk about how faith precedes salvation, or that is regeneration. And then lastly, God's part and man's part in our salvation. So first of all, total depravity. Many Calvinists see this as the the most important part of this five-point system, that this is the foundation upon which everything else is built. R.C. Sproul said, quote, If a person really embraces what is called the doctrine of total depravity, the other four points of this five-point system more or less fall in line. So, again, what is the doctrine of total depravity? I defined it in the first message, but here we'll look at it again. Total depravity asserts that mankind is so thoroughly sinful and depraved that he is incapable of ever seeking God or responding to God seeking him. In order to respond to God, God must first awaken him to life. This they call regeneration. Now, this teaching asserts that man's depravity, or sinful corruption, is thorough. It is a complete corruption of heart, mind, soul, and strength, and thus the natural man cannot desire the things of God, only the things of this world. Many Calvinist teachers will use the story of Lazarus as a good illustration of this. You remember Lazarus was one of Jesus' very dear friends. And uh, his sisters sent uh, for Jesus to come because Lazarus was sick. And Jesus delayed. Lazarus ended up dying. They buried him in in a tomb. And Jesus showed up four days later and he said, roll back the stone. And so they did. They rolled back the stone. And then Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus. Come forth, and he that was dead came forth. They will say that this is what must happen in each individual's life. In order for Lazarus to respond to Jesus' call of come, he had to be risen first. The dead body of Lazarus had to be raised to life by Christ before Lazarus could respond to Jesus' call to come. Many Calvinists say that like a dead corpse, a person in their sinful condition is unable to respond to God unless God miraculously raises him to life. Then, and only then, can man respond to God's call. New life, they say, must precede man's faith in Christ. A very well-known Bible teacher, a Calvinist Bible teacher, put it this way, quote, a dead man can't do anything, end quote. Like most erroneous teachings, there is a portion of truth in the doctrine of total depravity, It is true that mankind is sinful by nature and alienated from the life of God with no ability to save himself. However, the Bible teaches that though we are darkened by sin, God has graciously given sufficient light for anyone to respond to him by faith. Yes, God is the initiator of salvation. Man is the responder. Only when man responds in faith to the light God has given are they raised to new life in Christ. The Bible clearly teaches that repentance and faith precede regeneration. 
Now, as I said, man is a fallen creature. But remember in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it said, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. After God had made the sun, the moon, the stars, he made the, the, the earth with all the vegetation, all the creatures in the sea and in the sky and on the land. His crowning creation was mankind. And he placed the first man, Adam, and then his wife, Eve, in a garden called Eden. And God gave them one prohibition. Though he had supplied for all their, their needs with all the fruit trees, he said, there is one tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You're not to eat of that one. Now, by placing this tree in the Garden of Eden, God was giving Adam a choice. Adam could freely choose to love and obey God and continue to live in glorious fellowship with him. Or he, Adam, could freely disobey God in an act of rebellion and be separated from fellowship with the Lord for eternity. Unfortunately, Adam chose to disobey. He willfully sinned and ate the forbidden fruit. God did not force him to eat it. He did it of his own free will. The result of this one choice had staggering consequences upon Adam and all his descendants. In Romans chapter 5, verses 12, and then in verse 19, we read this, Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin... So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Adam's sin brought the entire human race into this place of sinful corruption. And we are all fallen. All mankind is now as the Bible says, dead in trespasses, in sins. Mankind is hopeless apart from God's intervention. We are corrupt and cannot save ourselves. Though we can do some good things, our goodness is not good enough. We fall short of the glory of God, which is perfect love. Perfect love for God and perfect love for others. We fall short of that. Now, many people wrongly believe that humans at their core are, are just good people. That we've just been corrupted by our environment. But if we can just look within and, and if others can help us find that goodness, it'll just come out. Are we good at our core? No, we're not. The Bible says we're corrupt at our core. And this is seen early on, even in little children. Little children lie, steal, disobey parents, and are violent to others. This behavior is not simply a result of what they have learned from others. It does not come from external influences alone, but from an internal corruption of the heart. I have nine children of my own. I've never sat any of them down and taught them how to lie. We don't have a TV, so they're not watching people lie on TV. But most of them have lied to me. Where'd they get it? Where did they learn to lie? It came from within. Mark chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, Jesus said that, he said, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. 
Jeremiah 17, verse 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Romans 3, 10, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I believe all means all. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.19 says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. That is the reality of our situation. It's a bleak one. We are all sinners. We are all corrupt. The wages of our sin or the penalty or the result of our sin is death. Not only physical, but eternal death and the lake of fire. All of us are sinful and deserving of spending eternity in the lake of fire. We have no ability to save ourselves. Our hearts are corrupt and in need of a savior. This corruption separates us from God and makes us spiritually dead to Him. It's important that we distinguish between two things. That is, there is a difference between annihilation and separation. Many Calvinists, in teaching about how we are dead in trespasses and sins, refer to this deadness as annihilation. But that's not what the deadness is. It's separation. Did man, Adam and Eve, cease to exist as spiritual beings because of sin? No. They didn't cease to exist. That's annihilation. What happened? They were cast out of the garden. They were separated from fellowship with God. Death is not annihilation. It is separation. In physical death, the spirit separates from the body. In spiritual death, man is separated from fellowship with his creator. To say that a lost person is like a dead corpse is to imply that they are completely unresponsive. All would agree that some sinners reject and hate God. This is a response from a responsible spiritual being. The sinner can respond negatively or positively to the light God has given them. They are without excuse. Sinners cannot blame God or anyone else for their own rejection of God's light. Now this teaching of total depravity, which says that man is is dead like like a dead corpse. He can't do anything. Well, a dead man can't sin either. I agree, a dead man can't do anything. A dead man can't sin. But lost people sin all the time. Again, death does not mean annihilation. It doesn't mean that man can't do anything. It means separation. That man is separated from his creator, and if he stays in that condition, he will be separated from his creator forever. That's a horrible prospect that awaits every individual unless God, by his mercy, made a way for us to be united to him again. You see, Adam and Eve were in perfect fellowship with God, but they lost that and are separated. But is there a way Would God, could God, would God come and make a way for us to be united to him again? Yes, he has. And now every individual is responsible for how they respond to God's gracious extension of light to us. 
That moves us to our next point, that God has given man sufficient light. And I might add this, God has given every man sufficient light. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. We're going to look at verses 27 through 31. This is maybe a familiar story to you. Jesus told it, but there were two men. One, his name was Lazarus. Now, it wasn't the Lazarus that he rose from the dead. This was a different Lazarus. He was a very poor man. He was a beggar, lived on the street. And the other man, we don't know his name. He's just called the rich man. But they both died. And it says that Lazarus was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom or paradise, the holding place for the Old Testament saints. And the rich man died and he went down into hell. And there in that place, the rich man cried across that great gulf that it's described here. And he says to Abraham, Abraham, send, send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and touch my tongue. He was in such torment that just the thought of a finger that's been in water touching his tongue uh, sounded like alleviation to him. Abraham said, no, we can't do that. There's a great gulf between betwixt us. And, and then the rich man went on to do what I've heard people say, uh, reveal a very evangelistic heart. No, he didn't have an evangelistic heart. He had an accusatory heart. Let's read it. Luke chapter 16, verse 27, it says this. Then he said, this is the rich man as he's burning in hell. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him, that is Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Hear this rich man. He says, Oh, just send Lazarus to go tell my brothers so they don't end up here. He was accusing God. He, he's acting as if he is more compassionate than God, that, that he at least would send somebody to tell his brothers because he didn't even know about this place. And Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Just read Moses and the prophets as they warned the people to turn to God lest they be judged. But this rich man had rejected all the messengers that God had sent. And his brothers were rejecting the messengers that God had sent. And Abraham said it right. Even if somebody goes back from the dead, they'll reject it. In hell, the rich man accused God of not having done enough to save his soul. His arrogance was rightly corrected by Abraham. The rich man and his brothers could never rightly lay blame at God's feet, for God had graciously sent prophet after prophet after prophet to call them to repentance. They rejected the testimony of God's messengers and would even reject God's own son, who was raised to life again. It wasn't true to say if one comes back from the dead. For Jesus came back from the dead, and most people reject his testimony. Now notice what it says here in this passage. The Bible does not say that they could not be persuaded, but that they would not be persuaded. When Abraham says, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. It is a matter of the will. It is a matter of desire, not a matter of ability. God had been so gracious to this rich man and sent him light, but the rich man had rejected it. Now, our eternal damnation is a result of our sin, first of all, but secondly, it is a result of our willful rejection of God's gracious offer of salvation. This is important. 
Every individual will go to hell for eternity because, yes, they've sinned, but then they have rejected God's gracious offer to be saved. God, in his great mercy, has given everyone a sufficient measure of light. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, it says this, Speaking of God, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. It is God who wills that all men would be saved and that all men would come to the what? The knowledge of the truth. Yes, God has given man sufficient light. First of all, God has given a conscience. That is a moral sensitivity. God made us different than all the other creatures. We, as humans, are made in God's image. And he has placed within us a moral sensitivity. The light of conscience shines within everyone. Now, I told you that I, I have children, and I know that my children, by nature, from a very young age, are sinful. But I also know that from a very young age, they have a conscience. For when they do do wrong, they run and hide. Or they try to cover it up. Or they go in, in shame. <laughs> Why? Because they know they've done wrong. How do they know that? Well, because they have a conscience. Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, it says, For when the Gentiles which have not the law, that is, they don't have the, the written scriptures like the Jews did, when they do by nature the things contained in the law, so naturally they do what's written in the law, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. This is an amazing truth. He says that we have the law of God written on our hearts. Now that is the moral law of God. We know it's wrong to steal. We know it's wrong to murder. We know it's wrong to commit adultery. Why? Because we're made in God's image. Now, there are some Calvinists that protest this point. They say, no, 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 no. Adam was made in God's image, but we are made in Adam's image. Well, that's... Not true. The Bible makes it clear that we're made in the image of God. After the flood, God instituted capital punishment, and he said if a person kills another person, then they need to be killed. Why? For in the image of God made he man. And then later on in the New Testament, in the book of James, it says, how can you bless God whom you've not seen and curse men? It says, who've been made in the similitude of God or in God's image. It's not right to say that Adam was the only one made in God's image. We're all made in God's image. And we have a moral sensitivity. Why? Because we're made like him. Oh, yes, we're fallen. Willfully in rebellion. But we still have that conscience. You see, the conscience is based on the moral law of God, which is based upon the nature of God himself. For instance, God did not just sit up in heaven and say, you know what, I think I'm going to make ten commandments, and uh, why don't we make one of them, thou shalt not steal? No. Stealing was always stealing. And it's wrong because it goes against the nature of God himself, because God by nature is a giver, not a taker. Adultery 
has always been wrong. It wasn't on Mount Sinai that when Moses came down with the law, now adultery was wrong. Way back in Genesis, when Joseph was, was, was uh, Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, he said, how could I sin against God? It was adultery then too. Why? Because adultery goes against the nature of God because God's faithful. Lying. It's a sin because it goes against the nature of God. He is truth and it is impossible for God to lie. The moral law is based upon the nature of God himself. And when he made us in his image, we bear that in our conscience. We all know it's wrong. Now there is a very dangerous thing. It tells us in 1 Timothy verses 4. And in chapter 4, verse 2, that there are some having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know, you can take a hot iron and, and burn skin, and then you can poke that skin all you want, and it has no feeling left. At one time it had feeling, but now it doesn't. And that can happen with people's conscience. They go against that conscience over and over and over, and before long they have lost the sensitivity. We must be very careful to guard and protect that conscience lest it become seared. But everyone has that conscience of right and wrong. That's light. And then we have the light of creation. God speaks to the entire human race through all that he has made. In Psalm 19, this very familiar passage, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. I just love that passage because here it is. You didn't have to speak Hebrew or Greek to know. He said everybody, everybody in every language group across the world can just look up at the heavens and it's declaring the glory of God to them. It's amazing. All you have to do is look at a little baby. I remember listening to the testimony of a man. He was a brilliant uh, scientist involved in the development of, I, I think it was the MRI imaging. And he said that, that they, were, they used that to, to go inside of a mother and see the development of a baby. This man claimed to be an agnostic, if I remember correctly. But he said as they were getting images of the development of the baby in the womb, he said this was, this was something that humans had never seen before. And he said this statement, I'll never forget it. He said, when we saw what was happening we had to attribute it to the divine. Now that's a fancy way of saying we had to give the credit to God. It was so miraculous. He was a man just looking at a baby and saying, there is a God. Romans chapter 1, verse 19 through 20, it says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Who showed it to them? God has. Unto who? <laughs> the lost Gentiles. For the invisible things of Him, God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being what? Understood. Not just seen, but understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. And then notice this, so that they are without what? Excuse. The Apostle Paul, in opening up his treatise on the gospel, says everyone in all the world has no excuse for the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen and understood by this created universe. So every person in all the world and in all human history has the light of conscience, a moral sensitivity. We've been made in the image of God. We have the light of creation that declares to us the glory of the Creator. And thirdly, the Holy Scriptures. 
The Holy Scriptures are a light. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. 2 Timothy 3.15, it says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. This verse is so important, for here the Apostle Paul says to, to young Timothy, Timothy, as a child, you've known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. Now, some Calvinists will protest at this point and say that an unregenerate man or woman cannot understand the Scriptures. And yet that verse that we just read, the Apostle is saying of this young boy that he had the Scriptures which had the ability to make him wise unto salvation, so he wasn't saved. He was lost. But there was the potential because of the scriptures that had been poured into his life by his grandmother and his mother. Yes, the scriptures can speak to the lost person. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 is often used to dismiss this idea that the scriptures are powerful in the life of the lost. For it says there that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man, and notice that verse, that word, it says receiveth not. They don't receive it. That's the issue. And because they won't receive it, guess what? It's foolishness unto them, and they can't understand it. But guess what? That's not just true of the unregenerate, but even of the saved. This verse is not talking about an inability of unregenerate people to understand spiritual truth, but is rather talking about the inability of carnal people to understand whether they are regenerate or unregenerate. For Paul went on to talk to the Corinthian believers and say, I couldn't speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Because you, couldn't re- you wouldn't receive it. This principle is taught all throughout the scriptures. Look again here at Romans chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, where it says, For the invisible things of him, that is of God, from the creation of the world are what? Clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart, what? Was darkened. You know, to be darkened means you had light. And that's what he's saying. He's saying they have all sorts of light, but they rejected it. And so they became darkened. You see, it doesn't matter who you are. You have to desire the truth of God if you're going to understand it. You know, when I do counseling, especially marriage counseling, And a couple come to me and say, well, we're having trouble in marriage or whatever. We we want counsel. I start off by saying, are you willing to receive whatever the Bible says before we even find out what it says? We have to start with your surrender first. Because if you're not willing to surrender, if you simply say, well, well, let me wait to hear what you got to say, then you're not going to get anything. 
Jesus put it this way, John 7, 17, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. This could be translated, if anyone wills to do my will. You have to have the desire. I've had that. Times that even as a Christian, even as a preacher, I've read something in the scriptures and I didn't understand it. Then I got on my knees and I said, God, what are you saying here? And he opens my eyes, gives me understanding. I didn't understand, but I desired. And then he opened it up to me. I love that story of the the disciples who came to Jesus after he had taught a parable. And they said, Jesus, what did that mean? And Jesus said, to you it has been given to, to understand. I think, wait a minute, they're just asking you what does it mean because they didn't understand it. But to you it's been given. And then Jesus went on to explain what he meant by that parable. I think what he was saying is this. To you it's been given to understand because you're seeking understanding. You're, you heard it and you're drawing near to me and now you're going to understand. But they, they heard it and they walked away. They didn't get it. Yeah, that passage in 1 Corinthians 2 about the natural man receiving not the things of God. They don't receive it. Therefore, it's foolishness to them and then they can't understand it. We need to be careful. If you do not receive the love of the truth, God will give you over to fables. Your heart will be darkened. You must become willing and ready to receive in order to receive. Oh, yes, God can speak to the lost through the Holy Scriptures. What is the purpose of preaching? Isn't the whole purpose of preaching the word of God to call sinners to repentance? Jesus said that in Luke 5, verse 31 and 32. Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus was calling out to sinners For them to repent. He wasn't calling out to righteous people to repent, but sinners to repent. The Apostle Paul did the same thing in 2 Corinthians 5.11. He said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we, what? Persuade men. Through Paul's preaching and his evangelism, he sought to persuade men. Some say, well, we can't persuade men. It's got to be God, the Holy Spirit. Oh, yes, the Holy Spirit is persuading men, too. But we are laborers together with God in the work of evangelism. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14 through 17, it says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yes. If people are going to believe, they have to first hear. In order to hear, somebody's got to preach. There has to be the preaching of the Holy Scriptures to give people the opportunity to believe it and be saved. Now, the interesting thing about this passage in Romans chapter 10, he goes on there to say, they have not all believed our report. And then he goes on further to say that there were many who heard, but because their hearing was not mixed with faith, it didn't profit them. Yes, they have to hear. That's the duty of the preacher. But then they have to respond in faith. And unless the sinner responds in repentance and faith, that hearing 
only condemns them. Now, Colossians 1.28, again, the Apostle Paul says, Whom we preach, speaking of Christ, warning every man and teaching, what? Every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That was Paul's heart's desire. He wanted everybody to get saved. And so he labored for that. Again, God has given the light of the Holy Scriptures. Psalm 19, verse 7, A, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. That means they are unconverted, but the law of the Lord works to convert them. Yes, every single person, though we are fallen, from fellowship with God. He has graciously given us the light of conscience, the light of creation, the light of the Holy Scriptures, and the light of His Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is at work in people's lives. John chapter 16, verse 8, it says, And when He is come, that is the Holy Spirit, Jesus is saying this, When the Holy Spirit is come, He will reprove the what? the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, this revolutionized my evangelism when I got this. I realized God the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and He is now reproving the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. I think we get it wrong. A lot of times we think, oh, we're going to go out and evangelize, and we pray and say, Lord, go with us. And I wonder if God up in heaven is saying, me, go with you? I'm already out there. I'm waiting on you. God is at work in people's lives. And once I realized that, again, it, it revolutionized my evangelism. I didn't approach people as if they were clueless, but people that I knew had a conscience that I knew could see God's hand in creation, and that I knew the Holy Spirit was actively working in their life, reproving them of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And then I come alongside as a laborer together with God and begin to give them the Holy Scriptures, trusting that the Holy Spirit will take His sword, for it's the sword of the Spirit, and start to do battle dividing between the thoughts and the intents of their heart. Yes, the Holy Spirit is working in the life of the lost to bring them to faith. And not just a select few. Genesis chapter 6, we read this. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, and then in verse 5, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This was just prior to the flood. God saw how wicked man was, and he said, My spirit will not always strive, for the Holy Spirit of God was striving with them, trying to get them to repent and turn but he said, I'll only do it so long. Eventually, I'll stop striving and I'll just bring down the hammer of judgment. And he did that with the flood. And the same is true today. The Holy Spirit of God will strive with people, but only to a point. At some point, God will say, OK. It's judgment time. Yes, God has given the light of conscience, the light of creation, the light of the Holy Scriptures. And he, by his Holy Spirit, is working to bring lost sinners to himself. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Jesus, it says of Jesus in John 1, that he is the light that lighteth every man that comes into the world. John 12, 36, A, while ye have light, Believe in the light that ye may be the children of light. 
John 3, verses 19 through 21. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Now turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 1. I've quoted uh, several portions from this, but I want to read uh, verses 18 through 32 as it lays out uh, the, the bleak and black state of humanity. But you will see over and over again that it isn't God's fault, it's man's fault. Man, and that man is without excuse, for God has come to them and come to them and come to them. And it says here in the old King James that they, they hold down that knowledge or they suppress it or they push it. Not that they don't have it, but they don't want it. And because they reject the light of God, he then gives them over to depravity. Notice how depraved they become because they reject God's light. As we read Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold or suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. Now, just pause there for a second. This is describing people who are dead in trespasses and sins. Again, this is not people who are annihilated. These are not dead corpses. These are people that are rejecting every gracious offer God extends to them. Again, verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause... God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Lesbianism. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. Sodomy. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Again, that sounds like a problem of the will, not of ability or inability. As I said, we will spend eternity in the lake of fire because we've sinned, yes, but because we have rejected God's offer, his gracious offer of salvation. Mm. Now let's move on to this next point, that faith 
precedes salvation. Faith precedes salvation. Remember in that story in the Old Testament of the serpent on the pole, the children of Israel had been complaining again about God, and God sent those serpents, and he started biting them. They asked Moses, go to God. Moses went to God. God said to Moses, make this serpent, this brass serpent, and put him on a pole, and whoever looks to that serpent on the pole will be healed. You see, the people had to decide whether they were going to believe that or not. Maybe one of them could have been in a tent, laying there, dying on their bed, and they say, did Moses go to God? And their loved ones say, yes. Moses said that God told him to make this brass serpent, put it on a pole, and you've got to go out there and look at it. And they could have said in that bed as they were dying, that doesn't make any sense. That won't do anything. Tell Moses to come up with a good solution. And they wouldn't believed in the power of God to heal them. But those who did believe and go out and look by faith, they were healed. God did not selectively choose to heal some of the people in the camp and then after he healed them, tell them to go look at the serpent on the pole. The offer was extended to all and the healing power was only given to those who responded in faith. You see, the ones who didn't go and look, they weren't healed. The ones who went and looked were healed. The ones who didn't experience the healing didn't experience the healing until they exercised their faith. And you will not experience salvation unless you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For Jesus used that story in John chapter 3 to talk about regeneration or the new birth. He had just been talking to Nicodemus, saying that you have to be born again. And Nicodemus said, how? And this was Jesus' answer to how a person is regenerated. He said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man himself, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Just like that serpent on the pole, Jesus says, I'm going to be lifted up on the cross, and whoever looks by faith to me, they are the ones that will be regenerated. It is a necessity, Nicodemus, that you are born again. How can I be born again? I will be lifted up on the cross, and if you believe in me, then you will be born again. The faith precedes the salvation or the regeneration. You ever heard the term cart before the horse? That's what so many Calvinists get wrong. They say, no, God must awaken you to life first. Then you can have faith. But the Bible says the opposite. John 1, 11 through 1, verses 11 through 13. He came unto his own, and his own, what? Received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he, the po gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is primarily talking about the Jewish people, his own people. He came to them, but they didn't receive him, most of them. Some received him, like Peter and John and Paul. And because they believed on Jesus, the power of God worked in their lives, but most of the Jews rejected so they didn't experience the power of God. They thought that all they had to do was be, be born of blood or born of the flesh. They were Jews. But that doesn't make you saved. 
Or here, the, it's not of the will of man. It's not man like, like the people at the Tower of Babel saying, well, we're going to build a tower that gets to heaven. No. <laughs> you and I can't save ourselves by our good works or anything else. It had to be God that comes down to us to save us. It was the will of God and it is the initiation of God to save us, but it is only those who will believe on him that will experience the new birth. Again, the Calvinist says that salvation or regeneration precedes faith. No, that's not the case. It is faith that leads to to salvation. Charles Spurgeon said of this point, quote, Absurd indeed is not this waiting till the man is cured and then bringing him the medicine? End quote. Look at these scriptures as I read through them one after another that shows that faith then results in salvation. Faith precedes salvation or it goes before. John 12, 46, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Colossians 2, 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Galatians 3, 26, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Acts 16, 31, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, this is a very important point. There is no saving merit in faith itself. It is the object of faith that is either powerful or powerless to save. I've used this illustration in the past. I'm quite certain that everyone who got on the the ship, the Titanic, had faith that that boat would make it across the Atlantic. They had faith that they would make it to the other side safely. But did they? No. They put their faith in a ship that sunk. And many people have faith. In fact, everyone has faith. They have faith in something. Some put their faith in Allah as Muslims. Some put their faith in the Hindu gods. Others put their faith in their own good works or in this or that. Faith alone isn't meritorious. Is man free to place his trust in God? Certainly. The Calvinists will say, no, man isn't free to put his faith in God. God has to give man saving faith. And they'll use Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, when it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And they'll say, see, faith is the gift of God. But that's not what it's saying. <laughs> You're mixing up the verse. He's saying that salvation is the gift of God. And he makes that clear by the following verse when he says, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation doesn't come because of good works, but because it's the gift of God that is received by faith. You see, faith is the conduit. Salvation is the gift. When I was a little kid, I loved to go to the bank. My mom would drive up into the the drive-up teller, and she would get that little tube or box out, and she'd put her things in there and then stick it in and push the button, and that 
thing would go up through that tube. We loved to watch them. And then we watch it go in behind the glass and the bank teller would get it out and do everything. And we were just excited because most of the time when that thing came flying back through that tube, there was a gift inside. It was a lollipop. They used to stick little dum-dum lollipops in there. Oh, they don't have those things anymore. Most places, it's all digital now. But you see, that tube was the conduit. It was the, the, the means by which that lollipop would get to us. And faith is the conduit. It is the means by which we receive the gift of God. Salvation isn't earned. It's not earned by faith either. Some say, you, you're saying that we have to earn salvation by having faith? No, it's very clear that faith is not earning. It's receiving. As somebody walks up to me with a gift and they say, Joel, I love you. Here's a gift. Would I be earning it by extending my hands out and say, oh, thank you. Somebody looks over at me and says, he thinks he just earned that gift. No, because I reached my hands out and received it doesn't mean I earned it. Those who receive the gift of eternal life by faith, they're not earning it. Now again, everyone has faith in something, in someone, in false gods, in themselves. Man is free to trust in whatever he wants. But only the God of the Bible is the trustworthy Savior. He is the only one that can save you from sin and death. Acts chapter 4 verse 12, it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's not enough to be a person of faith. You have to be a person of faith in the right person. In the right gospel. And only faith in the right person is powerful to save. Now this last section. God's part and man's part. There is God's part. There is a part in man's salvation that only God can do. And a part that only man can do. God's part is far greater than man's. God alone can initiate our salvation. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He alone can and did provide the sufficient sacrifice for our sins by sending His Son to die on the cross for us. He is actively working to enlighten us and draw us to Himself. He extends the invitation, Come unto Me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give thee rest. He is the seeker, the sacrifice, the suitor, that is the one pursuing, and the Savior. Our part is to surrender to Him. Now turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Again, that idea of those at the Tower of Babel who thought they would build a tower to reach to the heavens. No, we don't work our way up to God. It is God who came down to where we are to save us and then bring us up to himself. God is the initiator. God is the one seeking and saving the loss, yes. But we have to respond by faith. Look what it says here in John chapter 6, verse 37 through 40. It says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, all that he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up 
again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Many times this passage is used to say, look, it, it says there, all that the Father giveth will come to him. And he will raise them up the last day. Yes, but look what it says is the Father's will. That whoever seeth the Son and believeth in him is the ones he will raise up. This is the idea. That God the Father has said to the God the Son, you're going to go down and you're going to die on a cross for the sins of the world. And all who will believe in you are the ones that I will give you. Later on in John chapter 6, verse 44, it says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Yes. Nobody can come to, to Christ unless the Father is drawing him. But remember what Jesus said in John 12, 32. He says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will what? Will draw all men unto me. God is working to draw all men to himself through his Son, David Brown said of this passage, quote, Though he does speak of it as a sublime certainty which men's refusals cannot frustrate, he speaks of that certainty as taking effect only by men's voluntary advances to him and acceptance of him, him that cometh to me. You know how many times it says that? Him that cometh to me. The one who sees the Son and believes, the one who comes to me, is the one that the Father is giving to me. You see, God the Father is actively seeking a bride for his Son. That bride includes all who believe in and come to the Son. I had a friend in India. Over there, they do things differently than here in the West. They still have arranged marriages. And he, as the father, was trying to find a bride for his son. So he was going around interviewing girls and their family, and he would talk to me about it on the phone. Eventually, he found one, and his son got married. And I think everything is going great. But he was looking for a bride for his son. And God the Father seeking a bride for his son. And Jesus says to, to, to us, the, the, the ones that the Father gives me, they'll come to me, and I'm going to raise them up. But this does not deny our responsibility. And by responsibility, we mean the ability to respond James chapter 4, verse 6, and then verse 10, it says, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And then the application, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Many years ago, I was at my house talking to a Calvinist preacher friend of mine, and we were discussing this whole issue, and I said to him, I said, There is a condition which must be met for you to experience saving grace. And I said, the condition is humility. God giveth grace to the humble. And then it doesn't say, wait until God humbles you. It says, humble yourself. And he said to me, he said, so what? You're going to boast in your humility? And I said, no, I'm not going to boast in my humility. But if you won't humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, then he will not lift you up and you will not experience his saving grace. You will experience other graces for God will send the rain on the just and the unjust. You will experience a lot of the good of, the good of, of God on this earth. 
even as a wicked person, but you will never experience his saving grace unless you humble yourself. So humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. I end by asking this question, what about you? I have heard some say, well, I'm just waiting on God to move on me. I'm just waiting on God to to choose me. Listen, God already sent his son to die on the cross for your sins. God has sent his Holy Spirit to convict you and draw you to himself. God has sent the prophets and the apostles who have written it down for you. God has sent people in your life to preach to you, to bring you to faith. The sun has been lifted up on the pole. Go and look. Don't wait for God. Get up and go out and put your eyes on that serpent on the pole and believe. Don't wait for God. He's already working on your heart. Get up and get right with God today. Don't sit back and wait as if God just hasn't done enough to save you. Listen. How shall you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? Don't blame it on God if you neglect to get into the ark that he has prepared before the flood is coming. Get in. Be found in him. Not having your own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through faith. You want the righteousness of God? It's by faith. Come to him. Humble yourself before him. You can't save yourself. He has to save you. But he wants to. Call out to him. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call out to him and say, Oh, save me. Do you really want to be saved from your sin? Some people don't. They like their sin. They like it. Oh, they don't want to go to hell, but they don't want to be saved from sin. Well, that can't be. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Call out to him and say, Oh, Lord God, save me. That's his will. For he is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. So repent and believe the gospel before it's too late. Well, in our next message, part three, we'll deal with the you, unconditional election. And this one certainly has brought some confusion in the church, but we'll go through, find out exactly what is taught by this and uh, what the Bible has to say about it.